Uh, I would like to introduce Anna Nicklin. Anna is a writer, game designer. She's an academic studying uh, uh, the relationship between games and theater. And she's been working on a lot of independent games, uh, both as a producer and as a writer, studying how uh, games can tell better stories. So please uh, give a warm welcome to Hannah Nickley. Hey, how are you all doing? I am the last person before the break, which is a slot that I always like, actually. So I'm glad to be here. Um, my name's Hannah Nicklin, it says it on the screen. It says where you can find me on the internet on the screen as well, should you wish to do so. Um, I am, like uh, Federico said, I am a, a writer, a game designer, narrative designer, uh, producer, performer. Uh, I'm basically a freelancer in between arts and games, and in doing so, uh, I have to basically do a lot of everything in order to make a living. Which uh, So you shouldn't think, look at all that I do and go, that's impressive. You should look at all that I do and go, she needs more time off. Um, let's talk about some of what I do, just so you have a sense of where I'm coming from before I like, get into the talk proper. So this is what I'm working on at the moment. It's a game being developed by Die Gute Fabrik, uh, who are based in Copenhagen. Um, it's a game called Metacione. Can't really tell you much about it yet, because it's not out. Uh, but I'm working on it as a narrative designer uh, and as a straight-up writer. Uh, and it's a nice little puzzle-ish, story-ish game where you visit a uh, an island uh, full of lovely people and mutants ready to be your friends and you have to look after your ailing grandfather, you build some gardens which cheer him up um, and you learn about the little community there and the past and some of the secrets um, and it's a really really nice game to be working on so look out for it when it comes out. Um, I finished up in March doing a little bit of work on a game called Forest of Sleep which uh, is a game, a project, uh, a collaboration between Ed Key, who you might have heard of Proteus, but it's fine if you haven't, um, but that was his big game, uh, and uh, Forest of Sleep is sort of his follow-up, um, although not really to the same themes, um, which is a collaboration between him and Nikolai Troshinsky, who's an amazing uh, artist and animator, um, and it is an experiment in procedural storytelling. Uh, it's a graphical only storytelling game, so there are no words, um, and it is using the visual language and source material of Eastern European folk tales. Um, so it's attempting to look at how you can use visual procedural storytelling using Eastern European folk tales as a basis. It's quite a big, difficult thing, uh, and I worked both as a producer, so I got us a bunch of funding to do like a, a year and a bit of work on the project, bringing in a lot of other collaborators. And I also worked on the narrative design, so looking at folk tales and how we might uh, proceduralize them, how you can look at them as structure using a load of work that's already been done by literary theorists, like, uh, so there's a lot of base material there. But then thinking about how you can, number one, make a coherent story, and number two, crucially, make an enjoyable story, uh, which is the really difficult part. Uh, who knows if that, ga that uh, aim will ever succeed, um, but uh, Ed's currently sort of looking for publishers for it, so I'll get back involved again um, as soon as there's some money there. Um, I also have a personal practice, which is many and varied. Um, I write about games critically. Uh, the thing in the top right hand corner is um, uh, like a, a cover of a zine that I published which is also a series of performance talks exploring a psychogeography of games. So uh, going for walks with game designers in places that are important to them and talking to them about how the places in their lives affect the places in their game design. So I, I walked with Jake Elliott who made Kentucky Route Zero, Ed Key talking about Proteus, um, Holly Grammazio talking about how the, um, the streets of London affect her game design. Um, George Buckingham and his obsession with brutalism and how that translates into the visual spaces in his game design, etc. Um, at the bottom right here, we have me doing actual, legit, just performing. Uh, that's a piece called Songs for Breaking Britain, uh, where me and my punk band went into the streets of different cities around London, uh, cities around, including London, uh, Leeds, Stockton on Tees, uh, Manchester, Bristol, uh, places around the country. And we stopped people in the street if they wanted to be stopped, and we asked them what it meant to be from where they're from whatever that meant to them. We talked to them about what that meant. 
And every city that we gigged in, we wrote a song based on the answers that they gave us. Uh, so each uh, touring city had its own song, and a every time we went to a city, we'd make a set list kind of based on how we felt about our experience of the city. Uh, so it was a, a changing gig, essentially. Um, and then bottom left, that's a thing called a durational performance called Games We Have Known and Loved, a uh, game city a couple of years ago. I sat in a room, and I collected stories of games that people... Um, felt were really important to them, and the definition was super open. It could have been a game you invented with your siblings, it could have been a video game experience, it could have been a really loose definition of games, like maybe the kind of flirty game you played in a pool with someone you end up marrying that you met on holiday. Um, I collected those stories, and in exchange, I offered someone a story that I had already collected. Each story was given a title, laid on an index card on a table, and when you gave me your story and we wrote your title, it would go on the table, and then I would tell you a story of your choosing, and you would get to keep that index card. That story was yours to keep, it wouldn't be told again, um, and you could do with it what you like. You could pass it on, or you could just keep it as yours. And then at the top left, that's, um, that's my PhD certificate. Um, I have a, a PhD in, loosely speaking, games-influenced theatre and theatre-influenced games. Uh, fun fact, I had really bad food poisoning when that certificate came through the post, and I almost immediately vomited on it. Uh, it comes in a useful plastic sheath, so it wasn't uh, ruined. Uh, but those of you who may have attempted or uh, started or finished a PhD may know how cathartic that experience actually was in the end, like straight up just vomiting on three and a half years of my life. Uh, cool. Uh, and then these are gamey things that I've done, more gamey things. Um, so uh, Top Right is a really short little flat game that I made about coming from Lincolnshire in a beach, a particular beach which I take uh, like boyfriends to in order to test whether they're good. Uh, to see if they respond to landscape that's really important to me. Uh, bottom right and top left is a game called Teviot Tales, um, which uh, was a project where I was in residence on a housing estate in northeast London for like six months or so. And I ran a bunch of workshops, uh, really varied, not always around the theme of games. I did uh, poetry workshops with um, uh, women's... Uh, English as a foreign language uh, groups. I did um, uh, game design workshops for teenagers, uh, but like it's a really, it was a really, really poor, really poor um, community. And uh, the kids' workshops, I think the first one I did, I was um, like just eating a, a flapjack in the break between the next exercise, and someone came up to me and said, Miss, I know that you're not a teacher because you don't know that you're not supposed to eat in front of us. You don't know if I've had breakfast yet. Um, and so I quickly turned that workshop into just bringing a load of food with me. Um, and I collected stories from people with their permission. I, as part of that, got to know people in the community. All these workshops were free, although I should note that there are a billion barriers beyond free uh, that uh, will stop someone uh, thinking that they have the ability to articulate themselves in any way, uh, or the time even to do so. Um, but all the people who talked to me with their permission, I um, turned their stories into a, a twine piece where you can walk around the the estate essentially, and meet some of the people that I met. Um, it's a really simple piece, and actually the, the point was the process, not really the product, but the product exists, so there we go. And then the bottom left uh, example, final example of my work is um, another example of one of those pieces, those kind of activist pieces that I do where you sort of realize what the important thing is not the work. Um, so I got a bunch of funding because I was involved in a housing, um, piece of housing activism called Sweetsway Resist. Sweetsway is a housing estate uh, in North London which was essentially being sold off for very little to developers because Barnet Council wanted to make a bunch of money. Um, it's one of the most sort of Tory councils in London and they pilot a lot of the most abusive and offensive uh, policy in Barnet and uh, a group of families um, who were being like really ruthlessly evicted from their council housing uh, got together and they decided to occupy one of the houses on the estate. Um, they were joined pretty swiftly by a group of squatters who opened up a load of other houses and uh, made what they called Sweetstopia. Um, and then the community house remained as the house which the former residents were um, 
uh, occupying and also running their resistance movement from. So they opened up a second house and they renovated that using absolutely no money. They renovated it to incredibly high standard as a way to make the point that um, uh, br uh, British councils are deliberately allowing council houses, social housing, to fall into disrepair um, in order to then claim that they need to be knocked down and replaced with mostly posh flats and some social housing. So they, they renovated something, they called it the People's Renovation Home, um, and it was really beautiful. Anyway, I was involved a little bit in that. It's, it's quite far away from me. It's two hours from where I am in South London to get to that bit of North London. Um, and I was, I was there a couple of the occupation, um, the uh, eviction resistance like protests where we stood and we barricaded people in who, were trying, who they were trying to evict. Um, without already giving them um, other uh, suitable accommodation that they could move into. Uh, and I'd sent them a load of stuff, um, like a load of pillows and mugs and uh, bag tea bags, which they needed for the occupation. And it was really Im uh, important to me that that really incredible, because none of them, most of them were not activists before, and those who were act activists before were activists because they had been um, evicted from their homes in a different part of London. And most of them were single parents, most of them were women, because they were the people who more typically needed uh, access to uh, social housing. Um, and it felt important to me to record their stories somehow. So in practice, what I did was I interviewed them all and I made a little zine which you can download for free from the itch page which the game exists on. The game is a silly little simple exploration made in two days in collaboration with George Buckingham where you, you put logs on a fire and every time you do you hear a snippet of one of them talking. But the thing that's actually important is that I made and printed a really lovely zine which I gave to all of the, um, the Sweets Way Resist people for free, which is now in a bunch of radical uh, bookstores and available to download for free, which means that their stories are out there and their methodologies are out there. So sometimes I make work with the purpose of not actually making work, of giving money and resources to people who need it and repurposing public money so it goes to people who actually need it. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, um, so. Uh, that, that's my work. I, that, that was probably a bit longer than I should have gone on about it. Um, but I'm going to get to the actual talk now, so you'll be pleased to hear. Um, just a, a, a caveat before I start is that I'm going to use the phrase the playful arts when I uh, talk because I, um, I am including in that definition everything from proscenium arch theatre all the way to pervasive games, video games, etc. Um, this is some of the things I think that defi definition might include. I'm not a proper academic anymore, so I don't have to be exhaustive about my definitions. Um, but I like to think of theatre as a game so old that we forgot it's a game and decided it's a form. And I would certainly include, uh, I, I like using um, the term playful arts to include all of these things uh, because I think it's useful to think about their shared heritage and also in order to be able to learn from other disciplines the lessons that you might be trying to work on right now in a different discipline. Um, so, the talk. Um, oh cool, I gave myself a title, that's good. Um, okay. You know who I am, you know some of what I do. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, a particular moment eight or nine years ago. Uh, I was 23 years old and I lived in a tiny flat above some rugby boys at a sports university called Loughborough, uh, which is about an hour from where Robin Hood Forest is, in case you're trying to get your UK geography in your head. Um, about eight or nine years ago, I fell asleep on a book, two books in fact, in fact, that would, when I finally got around to understanding them, change the way that I thought about communication. Um, I did actually bring the books, because I like props. Uh, so if you are at all interested in having a look at them, they're here afterwards. Um, a little grey and blue book, which along with a little green and yellow book, uh, together would give me a means by which to articulate something that would be a guiding metaphor for how I think about my practice both as a game designer, writer, and theater maker, but also how I think about my politics, how I exist in the world and attempt to bridge my experience with others. I fell asleep on the books because, well, they're just really hard. <laughs> they're just really difficult books. They were both written in French originally, which I don't read, at least not well enough, in order to understand complex philosophy, for which there are a few suitable words already. So I was reading them in translation and having to use the careful translator's introductions as keys with which to understand them. 
I should say that falling asleep on a book is a kind of compliment from me. I always fall asleep on books that contain the kind of sentence that you have to read over a few times to test all of its levels of meaning. I love new ways of thinking. I like complexity. And it's just that sometimes I process that by falling asleep on them. I was researching the idea of community for a part of my PhD in games influenced theater and theater influenced games to try and define the idea of community beyond a pallid neoliberal definition which um, towards something more vital, alive, and true. And my supervisor had given me these two slim volumes of philosophy, Jean-Luc Nancy's Inoperative Community and Maurice Blanchot's Unavowable Community. Even now, I think about how many iterations those translators must have gone through to work out which English word to put in the title. For both Nancy and Blanchot, uh, community is something that arises from the encounter with the subjective other. I know that I am a subject, a human with agency. And though I don't feel your agency, through my experience, I know that you too are a human with agency, not an object, but a subjective other. The encounter between me and you, it is suggested in these volumes, reminds me of my limits. It reminds me that though I can know myself intimately, I cannot know other selves as intimately, but we share that knowledge of self-intimacy and that experience. That thing that we share, that thing in between us, these books suggest is where community lies. Community for Nancy and Blanchot is not a thing, it is a practice. It's not a product, but a doing thing, a process. Between the two books, they use two metaphors to describe what they mean by this, death and the lovers. When I sit with you as you die, when I hold your hand, pale, pressed with liver spots, a hand that as I have grown older, I increasingly recognize as so much like my own, as I sit with you, and you die, I am struck with the knowledge that I am sharing something with you, something that unites all of us and our experience, but at the same time, I am finally separated from you. We look towards a place I cannot travel with you, though I stay by your side. I reach a limit. It is between us, intimately. And then let us consider the second metaphor of the lovers. When we lie with someone that we desire, someone we love, someone for whom we bear a wanting so strong it is like a heavy dog is sitting on our chest. We entwine and interpenetrate the blindness of one another's arms. In that space, we push ourselves together. We cannot ever, ever, ever be one, but we love one another with the force of never, never, never being close enough. This definition of community the one summoned by these images is one of the in-between, of gaps we cannot close and yet the attempt to bridge them nevertheless. Community is impossible, unspeakable, unavowable because it can never be completed, produced. It is a destination that is never reached. The act is instead a process. It is where we meet, a process of trying despite certain failure. So I spent a, a week or two falling asleep on these books. And through absorbing them, I came to define community as a kind of profound, active empathy, an impossible meeting. I was in search of a new definition because I wanted to resist the constructed communities of politics and the media, held together by geography, marketing, demographics, or a spectacle of self, a gender, a class, a race, a minority. That's not to say that those concepts can't be owned and rewritten by the people who are contained by those definitions, but I was interested in the playful arts as a tool for representing and reconsidering those constructs. So I needed to reconstruct a definition of community that would resist pinning down, resist the means of making it productive or descriptive. I did not want an equation that produced a group of people. I wanted an equation that was unsolvable. So, I came to understand community as a constant process of recognizing the common in the different, a place of habitation that one can never inhabit, an in-between, between you and me, between what is that I know and what if 
that I imagine must be. So that metaphor that of the in-between, the space between what is and what if, that story, because that's what metaphors are, has been crucial for me. Community is an, an impossible in-between that exists because we try anyway. This became vital to my practice as I developed socially engaged art, games, and performance. And in that in-between, in between what is and what if, that is where art lives. Contained in that space is the invitation, the invitation to suspend disbelief. So we finally reached the title of my talk. Um, suspension of disbelief is a, a term that emerged in 1817. A romantic poet called Samuel Taylor Coleridge tried to describe the imaginative leap of faith that a reader makes when a writer infuses their writing with enough, quote, human interest and a semblance of truth that they forget that the story is unlikely or implausible as a whole because it feels true and human in the moment. In theater, the term of suspension of disbelief is colloquially used to refer to the act of the audience as they pretend that they aren't there for 90 minutes, together with the acts of the people on the stage who also pretend that the audience aren't there for 90 minutes uh, as everyone makes belief together. There is a peculiar power in suspension of disbelief. As part of the quiet attention of an audience, we conspire together to make space for what if, for the act of playful storytelling. So whether that be on a traditional West End proscenium arch stage in a medieval mystery play played out on the streets, Alan Caprow building structures of ice left out to melt slowly in 1967 LA, or as Augusto Boal invites an audience member in Brazil to step into the action and take their place in the workers' dilemma that his company have staged to ask them, what will you do? In all of these cases, the audience and or actors are invited to ponder what if, to suspend their disbelief, and then the art is the thing in between them that issues that invitation, even a structure of melting ice. The members of the public are suddenly faced with a world exactly like theirs, but where this strange thing exists, and yet also slowly vanishes. Also, suspension of disbelief by no means has to rest in the hands of a cast and an audience. There are lots of really powerful one-on-one -on -one performances and interactive works that I can think of that reduce the interface between what is and what if down to a small, careful gesture, like where Adrian Howells gently washes your feet. Or Brian Lobel offers to buy a minute of your time, which he records onto DVD for one pound, and then you can buy other people's minutes afterwards if you want. The quality of design there is different. The tension is higher because the disbelief is held tightly between two people and the story is different. Not one of complex and careful authorship, but of the many stories that blossom from a single question or act. What is it like to be intimate with a stranger? What is my time worth? I think that understanding the way that we conjure an in-between or build this interface between what is and what if is crucial to making good storytelling. So we must therefore consider the qualities and affordances of the invitation to suspend disbelief. And you'll be pleased to know that I have good news. The history of performance in the 20th century has done a bunch of this work for us already, and we can learn from it. So throughout the 20th century, the playful arts have explored the relationship between the playing audience and the playful artwork and the conventions around it, pushing at I really need to watch my peas, I'm sorry. Um, I do actually have mic technique, I promise. Uh, pushing at the following five interfaces between the audience and the artwork, which is how I'm calling them, interfaces. Um, so the text, the form, the environment, the performer audience divide, and the body of the audience and the participant slash player, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is what I'm calling, I'm just drawing up these as five interfaces. There's probably a bunch more that you could think of or finer grain definitions that you could make. But for the purposes of these talk, this talk, um, I'm going to give you a few examples of how I think the history of uh, 20th century performing arts, playful arts, have explored these interfaces, pushed the boundaries of them, and what we can learn from them. So, the text. Um, this is a futurist synthesis, a performance text. Um, 
I should, I guess, uh, give this a caveat of the fact that the futurists were all horrible fascists. Um, and you should bear that in mind with how they uh, were fascinated by um, war and machines uh, and assaulting their audience. Uh, but um, this is an example of uh, a, a futurist text. Um, but I guess another thing you could look at as well as futurism, which does similar things and was similar-ish in time period, is the work of Dada artists, but there aren't very good pictures of their text, so I've chosen a, a futurist one. Um, so they, there were Dada performers who turned away from the audience when they delivered their text. They made it inaudible, which caused fury and consternation at the time. Equally, futurist performances, with the uh, mandatory Nazi caveat, uh, lapsed into sounds that delivered incredibly short texts and sought to directly antagonize their audiences. Their text was intended to challenge, not vanish behind a story. These were aggressive moves against the assumptions about legibility, naturalism, the possibility of communication in a world after the Second World War, which they tried to express in breaking down assumptions around text and how it works. Um, form. So we've already seen this picture. <laughs> um, you have you some Bowal in, there, in yours as well? I mean, I was just watching yours going, how many more slides is he going to steal from me? Um, so this is a, a situationist work. Um, collage and subvertising are pretty well known now, but back in the 60s and the 70s, when Guy Debord was getting drunk and writing a billion manifestos, collage was new. It broke up known forms of art and advertising, of maps even, which is just an example of. And in breaking up those known forms and reassembling them into unknown ones, they threw the old forms into relief. They challenged that interface between spectacle, propaganda, and the design of city space, and invited us to find new relationships to images, messages, and places defined by others. I ask you to understand the forms that you use, and also how forms use you. The environment. The place for art, and the people who have access to that place, stops loads of people from accessing it, to relating to it. So we can find examples, there's two examples here. Uh, the bigger picture is of a happening um, of like 70s America, John Cage, et cetera, et cetera, which um, took playful art into factory spaces, warehouses and the streets. They challenged the environment that makes art and brought into relief the interface implied by art environments. Museums are not neutral spaces. Equally, you could look at the work of activist artists and community artists in roughly the same time period in the UK, there was a community theater movement happening. Uh, this sort of uh, architectural image is a fun palace designed by Cedric Price, an architect, and Joan Littlewood, a theater maker, um, who you might have heard of, Oh, What a Lovely War, which is on Netflix, you should watch it. It's also a very good play, deconstructing, um, I guess, I'll just, let's just say war. I won't go into explaining oh, what a lovely war. Um, so uh, for the Fun Palace um, was meant to be like a working man's club crossed with a village hall, crossed with a park, where craft and homemaking and music and play were all their own forms of art. So it was meant to be a new kind of environment for working class art. Um, community makers of the British 60s and 70s community art movement also made sure that they were working in village halls and pubs and going to where people already are rather than trying to bring them to the place of art and not just the art as well the process they opened up their processes to regular people for want of a better word and asked them what stories they wanted to tell so the way that you interpret these things can be applied to your process as well as the product the thing that you're making Environment shapes work, and work shapes environment. Uh, performer audience divide. Um, this is another one which I've stolen from uh, Paolo's uh, slides. Uh, this is a uh, Yoko Ono uh, from the movement Fluxus, which is a, a movement that happened at similar-ish time to the happenings in the US. And I'm super skating over a bunch of complexity, so please go and look this stuff up if you're interested. Um, one of the things that Yoko Ono in particular became known for were her instruction pieces. Um, other artists made some, but I really love hers. Um, small instruction-based pieces of art for a playing audience to respond to. You could follow the instructions, or you could think about how you might follow it, or you could work against it. 
They were small, pure challenges to the division between author and performer and audience, amongst all of the other things that they were and how they were interesting in other ways. I want you to remember and think about how audiences can perform and consider their actions and their relationship to the world and others through acting. Uh, and then the body of the playing audience. Um, Desert Rain from 2001, it's just sneaking into my 20th century definition there, um, is one of my favorite examples of a piece of work that plays with the formal assumptions around the body of the audience and the participant and crucially does so with care and consideration. It does so sparingly. It's not just about shoving you into a thing and then not leaving you room to reflect on anything. Um, Desert Rain was a response to the first Gulf War and the spectacular way that it was presented through the media. It invited participants to enter a space and remove their coats. And this small gesture, by the way, is a careful and brilliant way of saying you're crossing a threshold. They then were asked to put on black hoodies. They are cast not in roles which they have to try and maintain. They weren't asked to suspend disbelief in their own bodies, but rather they were asked to um, be themselves but slightly different. A crucial difference, I would argue, to allowing space for reflection, not immersion, which I don't find useful politically. So I'm paraphrasing a little bit from the Blast Theory website to describe Desert Rain now. Uh, the visitors are led into total darkness in the space after which they put on their black hoodies. Each visitor finds themselves standing on a footpad, and in front of them is a rain screen. So falling water, four meters across, provides a surface of fine spray on which they project an image of a virtual world. They play a video game projected onto the rain screen in search of a target they've been given the details of. When they secure their target, that target, a performer, emerges through the rain screen. They hand them a magnetic swipe card and they're asked to follow them. The final virtual space uh, in the game is a vast underground hangar containing a floating field of numbers, all of which are estimates of Iraqi casualties. They push through the rain screen and uh, led by the performer, they find the exit corridor from that room blocked by a large pile of sand. They have to climb over the sand and down the other side to reach the final room of the installation. The walls of that final room are full-scale photographs of the walls of an English hotel room. The room contains no objects apart from a magnetic card reader and a monitor cut into the wall exactly where the television would be in the hotel room. As each visitor swipes their card, their target appears on a monitor sitting in the very same hotel room the real person on whom that target is based. Each of the six targets has had their life changed in some way by the Gulf War, as a soldier, a journalist, a peace worker, an active or a passive spectator. They talk about their relationships to events, their proximity to them, and how real it felt. On leaving, the visitors collect their coats and bags, and at some point later, they will discover that a small bag of sand has been concealed in their coat or bag. The bag contains approximately 100,000 grains of sand. So the body of the participant is crucial to the meaning of this piece. The action implicates the audience member. They participate in distant gestures like playing a war game which suddenly turn into visceral encounters. And this may feel a little bit pat in like 2017, but in 2001, a lot of these arguments hadn't been exercised yet. What are we to draw? from all of this history of challenging the interface in the playful arts. Well, I'd like to propose that these things are considered affordances when we think about storytelling in games and games as a form of storytelling. Um, Affordances uh, is a phrase that I first heard used by Tom Armitage when discussing digital technology in the arts. In the article, he talked about understanding the grain of your technology like you would a specific kind of wood or clay of understanding the material so that you might work with or against that grain for different and specific effect. When we tell stories in the playful arts, when we invite people into the impossible in between, that peculiar suspension of disbelief, understanding the affordances, the material of storytelling in that space is important. So I think we can extrapolate these challenges to the art audience interface through the recent history of the playful arts into a set of affordances that as a writer, game, or narrative designer, you could work with for specific effect. 
Um, but for that to work, we need a first principle, which is please collaborate with writers and narrative designers early on in your process. Uh, Rihanna Pratchett said something very similar yesterday. If you can get people involved early on, people from different disciplines. It doesn't just have to be narrative designers and game writers, writers from different areas that might have uh, answers to questions that you didn't even know that you might need to ask. And work in a process-led, not a product-led manner if you're trying to explore stuff. Sometimes you have to work in a product-led manner because you're asked to make a product and you need to make some money. But ideally, you should not know what you're going to make before you go through the process of making it because Design is a process, not a product. Um, collaborate across disciplines, find out what ways of answering similar questions other art forms have developed. Work out the kind of story you want to tell or the questions you want to ask the player before you decide what exactly you're going to make. Where are you starting from and why? A mechanic, an aesthetic, a story, a particular piece of technology, a question, a message? Critique your choices, be conscious of your assumptions, and then think about how the narrative interfaces between game and player and how you want to use them. So, um, really quickly, and this is the last bit really, uh, I'm gonna take you through some games I think are really interesting and relate to each of these five interfaces really interestingly. Um, overusing the word interesting now, so let's move on. Um, this is a game called I Made This, You Play This, We Are Enemies by Jason Nelson. Um, and I think immediately you can see, uh, this is with regards to text. So um, you can see that this is a collage of an online space. Uh, this bears a very strong resemblance to subvertising and collage of the situationists. Um, it is attempting to make the familiar strange and making the legible illegible. Uh, it's got a pretty didactic message to it. It's not subtle, but it's representing environments to us that attempt to be invisible. Um, and is using the platform uh, form uh, and the, the visuals of um, Google and web searches and advertising in order to do so. Um, I think it's very effective and I encourage you to have a look at it. So form and genre, uh, this is Kentucky Route Zero, which if you haven't played, I think is one of the like, modern masterpieces of our age. Um, one of my favorite moments in Kentucky Route Zero, the moment where I really realized it was a bit different, um, was when you're suddenly switched from playing the hero to playing Shannon. The first time you enter a mine where you have a, a task to do, if you haven't played it, I don't want you to make you feel excluded. Um, th there's just a, you don't really need to know much apart from there's a mine and you're playing as the hero character. It's a white guy, of course it is. Um, and it's a, a basic point and click. But suddenly you enter this mine and you are cast as a woman. Uh, you're suddenly switched. You didn't make this choice. It's not a mechanic that it's trying to, to teach you. It's not a puzzle-solving thing where you're going to choose a different character because they have different specialisms. You're just given someone else's voice, and the story suddenly isn't just about this one dude. It's a, a tiny bit of playing with the, um, the, the formal expectations of this kind of storytelling and this kind of game. You're not just a person, one person, the person. There are many. And this is later expanded in the Museum of Dwelling, really interestingly, I think. Um, it's a museum of different kinds of dwelling, and you explore it in search of a particular character, the next bit of the story. Um, but you don't explore it in real time. Every time you take an action, the characters that you interact with um, reflect on it in the past. They're reporting your movements to someone who came to investigate you. So you're hearing future dialogue as you uh, attempt to act in the present. Um, Kentucky Route Zero in understands intimately the form of storytelling in this particular genre, and in these small ways, it subverts it. Um, they make it strange and new and unsettling, and that is exactly how the characters feel. Strange, in weird places, unsettled. They use the form to communicate a lot of what the characters are going through in you. I think that's really clever. Um, this is an example of how game pieces can explore the environment or work with the environment as a material. So this is a piece by a company called Invisible Flock. They are originally a theater company based in Leeds, which is in the north of England. Um, and they decided, they, they, they do work with like Arduino and technology and all that kind of thing. Um, but they did decide that they wanted to make a, a game. So they just sort of learned Unity and uh, a bunch of other stuff and turned their theater studio into a game studio for uh, two years. Um, 
If You Go Away is an experience for a smartphone for specific cities around the world for a specific time of day. You can only do it uh, at dusk. Um, and it's a story that you respond to on your phone, which is also involves audio, um, but it repurposes parts of the environment into the architecture of the story of the game. The story of the game is slightly odd. You feel like it's maybe dystopian or a parallel reality. Um, but the fact that it uses um, items from the real environment and GPS to set the unreal and the real world of the story over each other as layers is incredibly effective. They don't have to do so much work in the game to make it feel real or whatever because they are tagging it to the real world. Crucially, they're really careful about your safety. There's lots of real world testing that they do. Um, they do choose a specific time of day. And I guess if you're going to work with environment, please remember that environment isn't just a place, it's time and people and more. Um, I, as a woman, might not feel safe in a certain place of town after dark. Um, dusk is also a really interesting time to choose because it is an in-between time. They have chosen this in-between time to set the real world against a parallel world. I think that's a good design choice that uses environment as a medium. Um, they also are connected to the places that they're from. They're based in Leeds, and this was originally a, a just available in Leeds, and they use a bunch of uh, Yorkshire brass band music in it, just little touches like that, which uh, connect to the environment. And the experience is not one size fits all. It asks for your name. It gives you gentle choices that you can make. And those choices don't t claim to change everything. It doesn't claim to be uh, an incredibly um, immersive, interactive experience that you are in control of. It gives you gentle choices and is honest about them. And in that way, allows you to choose exactly how much you want to be in or out of the making believe, the suspension of disbelief, which is important because our bodies are environments as well, ourselves are environments, and each of them is different. So, fine, no, second, penultimately, um, this is uh, the body of the participant. Two really simple examples of games that are interestingly doing that. Aspix by uh, Droken, I'm not sure how that's how you pronounce it, it's D-R-O-Q-E-N. Um, I think that we don't often think enough about how our minds are also bodies. Um, and the play uh, in the bodied world is super harder to author for, like strictly author and design for, but it can also be powerful and effective. Uh, this game is a game where sometimes your character is underwater and it basically asks you to hold your breath whenever you are underwater in the game. Really simple and really effective. <laughs> Like the sense of, of jeopardy is suddenly increased by that simple request. And you don't have to play with it. It's not forcing you to do it. And it's also not placing that suspension of disbelief on you heavily, like if you were suddenly also having to um, make other people's experiences like um, interesting or fun or develop a story with other people and holding your breath. That could make you anxious. This is just a, a thing between you and a game, and it's, it's gentle and simple, and I think it's really cool. Uh, this is a second example, uh, Lea Schoenfelder's uh, Perfect Woman, which is a, I think it's a Kinect game. Anyway, you, you basically are invited to um, uh, follow the life of a girl child after she's born and make choices about what you're going to study at school and what your next experiences are going to be. But in order to make those choices, uh, you're given a cutout of a series of poses that you have to hold. And if you choose a difficult thing, like you want to study astrophysics, they're really difficult poses. And if you want to uh, drop out of school and go have fun, they're quite simple poses. Um, and uh, you have to contort your body in order to mold into the woman that you grow up to be. Um, it's a really simple like, point. I'm pretty sure we all get it, that <laughs> women are uh, asked to perform to gender roles. But it asks you to understand that with your body. And that understands its question, and it uses the material vitally and interestingly. Um, None of these uh, two examples are invasive in any way. And they allow for different perspectives as well. Um, everyone breathes. And using breath and inviting people to do so, not doing it in the context of a bunch of others putting pressure on you, is interesting, but also careful with this participant. And equally, a perfect woman, um, you can play this as a man. And it 
because you're, you're basically just, it doesn't mean that you won't understand what it's telling you. Everyone has a body that they can put into positions, I guess, accepting people with uh, mobility issues. Um, and I guess it might be interesting to ask Lea Schoenfelder if she thought about that. Um, so these are, I think, really interesting examples of how you can use the body of the participant as a material when you're trying to communicate something as part of a playful artwork. And you'll be glad to hear that we're on the final example now. Um, this is um, the, audio, the audience author divide and how you can play with that. Um, this is a picture of another blast theory piece called Rider Spoke, which I think is like early 2000s um, because it's before iPhones and Androids. This is like an iPack. HP tablet, the first like PDAs, and there were loads of artists in the UK doing really interesting stuff with GPS in the early 2000s using these HP devices because HP Labs set up like a creative department where they invite a load of artists in, which was like super rad. And if you own a, any technology, you should definitely invite artists in all the time. Um, so this piece, you're given a bike with a PDA on it, you plug your headphones in, and you're invited to sort of cycle your way around the city and discover pieces of story that other people have left. There is a, a, a story that you also follow and you're invited to leave recordings yourself too. Um, we're making playful environments where the actions of player leave a mark in this context, where we consider the persistence of actions in game space uh, and the stories of the people that you invite to play. Um, equally, Wish Fishing by Paul Clarisseau from the Klondike Collective um, is a really simple expression of this. It's a divination tool. You ask it questions and then like a black, when you shake a, uh, whatever they're called, what are they called? Magic 8 ball and it gives you yes, no, maybe, etc. Uh, this game gives you some symbols in answer to your question and you interpret those symbols like the I Ching or a tarot. Um, but one tiny little thing about the design of this beautiful little piece is that when you cast your wish with a fishing rod, um, you see all of the other wishes that have been made by other people playing the game. And that little gesture in the design, I think, is the thing that ties it all together because uh, divination is about control and the, the way we try and make meaning in the world. And it is an essentially human thing and a thing we have been doing for many, many, many years. And that little design choice, I think, just makes that point gently and as part of the background almost. So that's my time nearly up. Um, do I have a blank slide? Yeah, I do. Cool. That's what I wanted. Um, I hope that you found my ideas chewy and challenging and maybe useful. Um, and I will try and remember to share this text in case you want to, I guess, fall asleep on it a little bit. Um, but if you've taken particular things away from this, I hope that these are the things that I've expressed. That I think it is useful to think about video games as part of the playful arts, which is on a spectrum which includes games and theater and live art and performance and lots of things that we need to be careful when we make work that implies or works with agency because of the world that we live in and because of part of the material we're working with is real people. That to be good designers and to avoid harmful or politically questionable choices, we should therefore consider on whom and how our work has an effect. That understanding that the way that we conjure an in-between or build an interface between what is and what if when we invite people to suspend disbelief is crucial and, that so to do, and to do so we must consider the qualities of the invitation, the text and how we use or reuse it, form and genre expectations and what they mean and how we might work with or against them, the environment around our players and how games we design might intersect with them, the bodies of our many participants, how we understand that we are all mind-body things and that part of thinking and playing and understanding is embodied, not just a brain connected to a pair of hands on a controller. The author-audience divide, what it means to design tools for a world that you let others build for you. So eight or nine years ago when I was 23, I fell asleep on a couple of books that would help me articulate storytelling as an act of profound impossibility, of bridging unbridgeable divides. It is not a product, but a process. And I hope you have enjoyed hearing about some of my process thinking. Thank you for listening.